Okay, so good evening and good morning. <laughs> uh, I would like first of all to thank um, Rebecca and Paolo and Andy for organizing this workshop and for inviting me to speak here. Um, I would like to tell you, uh, can you hear me well? <laughs> well. Okay, yeah. good, thank you. Yeah. Just checking. Um, um, I would like to tell you about some of our theoretical approaches to a, a very interesting class of biophysical experiments, namely single molecule pooling experiments. In this experiment, individual biological molecules or molecular complexes are pulled apart, just as it happens to the molecule uh, in the title, uh, and uh, the response of the molecule is monitored in real time. Now, how one can do this experimentally? Uh, one experimental technique that allows one to manipulate with individual biomolecules is atomic force microscope. Uh, in atomic force microscopy, a molecule is tethered between a stage and a t the tip of the atomic force microscope can deliver. Uh, the molecule is shown in red uh, here, it can be protein. Uh, and uh, then the force is applied to the stage to pull the molecule apart. This builds up stress in the system and the molecule unfolds. And the force uh, it, at every instant of time, including the instant of unfolding, can be monitored by, uh, uh, can, can be obtained by monitoring the dis dis deflection of the uh, cantilever of the atomic force microscope from the equilibrium position. Another experimental method that allows one to manipulate with single biomolecules is laser optical tweezers. Uh, in this case, uh, the molecule, shown here as a nucleic acid hairpin, uh, is attached to two beads. One bead is trapped in the optical trap, uh, another bead is attached to a micropipette, and then again the force is applied to uh, pull the molecule apart, um, and the force is determined uh, based on the uh, displacement of the bead from the center of the trap. And here is another experimental method that allows one to manipulate with individual molecules, uh, nanopore force spectroscopy. Uh, here, um, individual biomolecules, uh, such as nucleic acid hairpins, are forced to translocate through a nanopore uh, in a membrane um, under the uh, applied voltage. And this translocation is accompanied by the uh, unzipping of the double-stranded part of the hairpin. In this case, the uh, force of the voltage uh, at rupture then unfolding is monitored uh, based on the ion traces, uh, ion current traces uh, through the nanopore. Uh, so there are several other experimental methods that allow one manipulate, to manipulate with individual molecules. They exploit different ideas, but they do have something in common. And this is the resolution, spectacular resolution. The forces are measured uh, in a Newton range, and the distances are measured with a sub-nanometer resolution. Uh, so it is clear that with such a resolution, these experiments have the potential to provide unprecedented information on structure, dynamics, interactions, uh, mechanical properties of, of biomolecules. Uh, what we are interested in is uh, in developing a quantitative framework, theoretical frameworks, uh, which would allow one to uh, take single molecule data from this kind of experiments and to extract some information about the uh, underlying microscopic mechanisms that drive biological processes. So let me uh, uh, spend a, a, a couple of moments um, on uh, um, what exactly are the outputs of the single molecule pooling experiments. Uh, there are generally two uh, major uh, pooling regimes to weigh two ways with which one can pull in the molecules. One pooling regime is a constant speed regime, and the second one is a constant force regime. In the constant speed experiment, uh, the applied force is ramped up literally with time, uh, so the pooling speed is constant, V is constant, and what is measured in this experiment is the uh, instantaneous force on the molecule uh, as a function of time or as a function of the extension. Uh, the typical uh, force extension curve uh, is, uh, looks more or less like this. Uh, the peak of this curve uh, corresponds, indicates the moment of rupture or unfolding, and uh, the peak gives us the value of the um, rupture force. Now, uh, because the process is stochastic, if we repeat the experiment on the same molecule or on an identical molecule with the same value of the pulling speed, uh, the rupture force next time will be, generally speaking, different. So what one has to do is to repeat this experiment many, many times uh, at the same value of the pulling speed and to collect the distribution of the rupture forces, this kind of histogram. So we have a probability as a function of the 
probability of to observe a given rupture force at a given value of the pulling speed. Then one changes the value of the pulling speed to V2, obtains another distribution, and so on. So the output of the constant speed experiment is this quantity P of F, the distribution of rupture forces at a given value of the pulling speed. The uh, second uh, pulling regime is a constant force regime, constant force experiment. In this case, uh, the force on the molecule is maintained constant, which is a highly non-trivial uh, task experimentally because uh, one has to adjust the two ends of the molecule at every instant of time in response to what the molecule is doing to ensure that the, the force is constant. So people use sophisticated uh, uh, feedback mechanisms to, to do this. What one can m measure in the constant force experiment is, uh, for example, the end-to-end -end distance of the molecule is a function of time. So if we look at the end-to-end -end distance as a function of time, we'll see that nothing will happen for a while, and then suddenly this length will increase. Uh, this is an indication of the unfolding event, uh, and from this uh, uh, trace, one can uh, extract the time tau at rupture. How long did it take to unfold the molecule at a given value of of the constant force. Again, because the process is stochastic, if you repeat the same experiment on the same molecule with the same constant force, the rupture time will be different. So uh, one has to collect the distribution of rupture times at a given value of the constant force. And from distribution, one can get uh, the uh, this quantity tau of f, which is the force-dependent lifetime, the characteristic lifetime. So two, pulling, two kinds of pulling experiments, constant speed and constant force, and two major outputs, experimental outputs. P of F is a distribution of rupture forces measured at constant speed, and tau of F is the characteristic lifetime, force-dependent lifetime. So uh, how one can approach this uh, problem uh, quantitatively? When attempting to develop a quantitative description of the force-induced molecular transition, one is faced with First of all, a far from equilibrium system, which also uh, possesses a vast number of degrees of freedom. We have degrees of freedom both of the molecule and of the environment, uh, of the surrounding environment. Uh, how one can make this problem tractable? Uh, usually, uh, uh, one makes a simplifying assumption. The assumption is the following. Among all these degrees of freedom, there is one, namely uh, the end to end distance of the molecule, x. Okay, which is represents the slowest mode of the dissociation unfolding process. So uh, in this case, if x is slow, the slowest coordinate, then the uh, unfolding occurs as following: uh, as follows, uh, as x changes relatively slowly, all the other degree, degrees of freedom adjust very rapidly to the slow change, and because they rapidly attain Boltzmann equilib equilibrium, we can integrate them out. So we can. Uh, pack the effect of the fast degrees of freedom into the uh, thermal bath. Okay? And uh, what we uh, have now is the uh, free energy, which is essentially a potential of mean force, as a function of the slow uh, coordinate, x, the pulling coordinate, the end-to-end -end distance of the molecule. Uh, so. Uh, in the simplest case, this g of x, this free energy as a function of the pulling coordinate, looks like this. Uh, it has a well and the barrier, uh, which is a transition state. Uh, now, because the uh, this systems are small, the molecules are of mic microscopic dimensions, um, it is the, it, it puts the thermal fluctuations on nearly equal footing with the external deterministic forces. And this means that this problem can only be approached in probabilistic terms, right? So we uh, have to consider an ensemble, a statistical ensemble of nominally identical molecules. At a given moment of time t, each of the molecule has its own configuration. So we are looking at the distribution of these configurations. And this distribution evolves with time. So we assume that this evolution is described by, uh, uh, by diffusion process. So we can imagine a Brownian particle that is diffusing on this free energy uh, profile g of x, uh, and um, so what the again what this Brownian particle represents is uh, the evolution of the probability distribution of the molecular configurations. When the Brownian particle is in the well, it means that our molecule is folded. When the particle escapes over a barrier, over the barrier, the molecule is unfolded. 
Uh, in the absence of the pooling force, uh, this is more or less the situation. And uh, uh, in this case, the uh, free energy profile, G of x, can be de described by three parameters, three parameters that uh, characterize this intrinsic profile. One parameter is tau naught. This is the, the intrinsic lifetime. How long will this, will this Brownian particle sit in the well before it escapes over the barrier? Uh, the second parameter is delta G double dagger, which is the height activation free energy barrier. And the third parameter is X double dagger, which is the distance to the transition state, the distance between the well and the barrier at zero force. Now, uh, single molecule pooling experiments are done in the presence of the uh, stretching force, right? So we uh, need to um, understand how, what, what is the effect of the force on this free energy profile. Well, uh, the force somehow distorts the free energy profile so that these three parameters, the lifetime tau, the uh, height of the barrier, and the distance to the transition state are all now function of the force. And one of our goals is to uh, be able to reconstruct these intrinsic parameters, the parameters that characterize the free energy profile in the absence of, of the force based on the, these force dependent quantities. <coughs> so, uh, uh, it, can, can you hear me well still? Good, okay, thank you. Uh, so, as I just described, our approach is based on this diffusive picture of, of, of the picture of diffusive crossing of a barrier, uh, of a single barrier on the free energy uh, profile as a function of the pooling coordinate. In addition, we are going to assume a so-called quasi-adiabatic approximation, which uh, means that the survival probability S of t uh, uh, is governed by this first order rate equation. The survival probability is simply the probability that the particle is still in the well by time t. And what it means in practice, this quasi-adiabatic approximation, is that one should not pull too fast. Uh, however, the survival probability is not exactly what we're interested in. We're interested in the distribution of rupture forces. This is what is measured in the constant speed experiment. So we can take advantage of a simple relation between the survival probability, more precisely it's time derivative, F, S dot, and the distribution of rupture forces, P of F. And based on, on uh, this pieces, this uh, blocks, building blocks, one can uh, write uh, down this general formal solution for P of F, for the distribution of rupture forces measured in, in the constant speed regime. Now, uh, this is a formal solution, and uh, if we want to turn it into something practical, we have to overcome at least two uh, obstacles here. First of all, uh, we don't really know what tau of F is. Remember, tau of F is a force-dependent lifetime measured in the constant force regime, and we need to know its functional form to be able to use it in this equation. And uh, secondly, if once we have established this functional form for the tau of F, we need to be able to uh, do something with this integral. So uh, let's uh, uh, look at these problems uh, one by one. First of all, force-dependent lifetime, how one can determine the force-dependent lifetime. Uh, one approach uh, is, this is a phenomenological approach, which had been used for about a decade in the field, is based on uh, Bell's postulate, Bell's expression. Uh, Bell uh, tells us that the, the uh, force-dependent lifetime, ex uh, the force accelerates the lifetime single exponentially, so that the lifetime in the presence of the force, tau of f, is equal to the lifetime in the absence of the force, tau naught, which is the intrinsic lifetime, times the exponential of something which is depends linear on the force, linearly on the force. Uh, one um, attractive feature of this expression is that if you take log of both sides and plot the logarithmic lifetime as a function of force, this expression tells you that you would expect a, you would obtain, obtain a straight line. Uh, so uh, let's look what, what is behind this uh, postulate. What is the assumption behind this postulate? The assumption is uh, that the effect of the force on the free energy landscape in one dimension is solely to lower the barrier. If this is the only effect of the force, then you can write down the amount by which the barrier is lowered as the product of the force F and this quantity X double dagger, which is the distance from the well to the transition state. Uh, in other words, this expression assumes that the distance to the transition state, x double dagger itself, is constant. It assumes that it is, doesn't, is not affected by the force. How, uh, how reasonable is this assumption? 
So uh, to answer this question, uh, it's we, we can inspect a simple, uh, smooth, free energy profile, which looks like this. Uh, and uh, more specifically, how this profile evolves as the force is increased. So what we can see from this picture is, uh, as the force is increased, the barrier indeed goes down. But what happens to the transition state? The transition state, which is indicated by these little arrows here, uh, clearly the transition state moves towards the native folded conformation. Right? So the distance is certainly not a constant, it's a function of force. And in fact, uh, at a critical force, when the barrier to rupture has vanished, uh, we can see that the barrier actually merged with, with the minimum. Right? So the distance to the transition state shrinks all the way to zero. Uh, so you know, from this picture, it looks like it's a, a rather trivial geometrical uh, fact. But uh, in fact, uh, this, um, this phenomenon can be viewed as a, a special <laughs> illustration uh, of a more general principle, apparently known uh, for a long time in organic chemistry, uh, known as Hammond postulate, the Hammond behavior, which was formulated by Hammond in the 50s. Uh, Hammond argued that the faster the reaction occurs, the more reactant-like becomes the transition state. So what we observe in here is that the uh, higher the value of the force is, the more the transition state resembles the folded state, right? It moves towards the folded state. So the bottom line is that the distance to the transition state is clearly a function of force. Uh, it's, uh, it's not a constant. And as a consequence, uh, we uh, predict that the logarithmic lifetime uh, will not be a, a straight line when plotted as a function of force, but instead will show some nonlinearity. And this nonlinearity would be a consequence of a very basic fact. The fact is that the transition state moves towards the folded state as the force is increased. But now, when, when we have realized the limitations of the Bell's uh, uh, expression, we are back with to our original question, how to find the force-dependent lifetime. Uh, so there is another approach uh, to this problem, and this is a microscopic approach. Uh, the microscopic approach says, let's use Kramer's theory. Uh, Kramer's theory gives us this general, uh, again, rather formal solution for the lifetime in terms of the diffusion coefficient, d, and in terms of the features of the um, um, underlying free energy landscape. Uh, so these two integrals, the first integral is over the well region, the second integral is over the barrier region of the combined free energy landscape, the intrinsic plus the effect of the force. Uh, and as, as you probably know very well, these integrals are related to the local curvatures in the well and in the barrier region of the uh, free energy profile. Now one non-trivial uh, uh, aspect here is that this formula, Kramer's expression, contains g of x, the free energy profile, which we need to you know, integrate. Uh, the problem is that this is exactly what we don't know. We, we want to find the free energy profile, right? Uh, we want to, to determine the features of the free energy. So our approach was to, uh, uh, to do the following. We can uh, assume some simple model potentials, like these two shown here, and work out the Kramer theory for these two model potentials. And uh, we picked these two models. Uh, probably th they are just the simplest ones one, one can think of. Uh, the first, the red uh, profile, is a linear cubic potential. The blue profile is the harmonic well cusp like barrier. And uh, we can uh, use these models to, uh, uh, in the right hand side of this expression, to determine the force dependent lifetime. So um, I skipped the details of, of the calculation, and, and I would like to show you the result. Uh, so uh, here's the result for the force-dependent lifetime uh, from Kramer's theory. On the left-hand side, we have tau of f, which is the force-dependent lifetime, the experimental output of the constant force experiment, as schematically shown on the left. On the right-hand side, we have, uh, first of all, the force, which is the control parameter in the constant force experiment. And we have three parameters that can be used as fitting parameters in fitting the experimental data. The three fitting parameters are tau naught, this is the intrinsic lifetime, x double dagger, this is the distance, the location of the transition state in the absence of the force, and delta g double dagger is the activation free energy barrier in the absence of the force. So the recipe now is very simple. One can use this closed form solution to feed the data and to extract the three parameters. What is uh, particularly interesting is that this expression also contains, uh, you probably noticed this uh, parameter nu, okay? So what is nu? 
Nu is the scaling factor that allows us to uh, formulate this unified approach uh, to write down this sim single you know, result for several different models. Specifically, when <coughs> the scaling factor nu is equal to 2 thirds, this is the result for the linear cubic model of the underlying free energy profile. When nu in this expression is equal to 1 half, then this is the result for the second model, the cusp like uh, harmonic well and the cusp like barrier. Uh, so it turned out that it was possible to write uh, the result for these two models as a single equation. But what is e perhaps even more remarkable is that when nu is this, this expression is equal to 1, then the phenomenological Bell's uh, result is recovered. So uh, this is the uh, output of the constant force experiment. Uh, it's a closed form solution, which is convenient in fitting the data. Uh, however, you know, one can solve this uh, kind of problem for essentially any model. It's not a big deal. Uh, the, perhaps the only remar remarkable thing there is that it was possible to write down this general scaling for different models. What is uh, less trivial is to obtain the second quantity, the analytical, an analytical solution for the uh, output of the constant speed experiment, namely the distribution of rupture forces, P of F. And uh, one reason that it's not really trivial is because of that integral that we need to evaluate. And this is where this approach, these two models, linear cubic and harmonic um, uh, cusp, bring us uh, a reward because it turned out that for these two models, this <coughs> integral in the expression for P of F can be evaluated analytically exactly. And this is the result. Uh, this is a closed form solution for the second experimental observable, P of F, the distribution of rupture <coughs> forces measured in the constant speed regime. Okay? And again, on the right hand side, we have some control parameters. Uh, specifically, we have F dot, which is the force loading rate. It's simply the product of the pulling speed and the uh, stiffness of the spring, whatever the spring is. It's AFM cantilever or optical uh, trap or something else. Uh, also, we have three fitting parameters. Tau naught, delta G double dagger, the height of the barrier and the width of the barrier in the absence of the force, right? And also we have nu, the scaling factor, which again um, allows us to write down this uh, <laughs> as single uh, solution for several different models. Uh, so uh, this analytical approach, it, it has been applied to various kind of experimental data from different kind of techniques, and in some cases it was uh, quite uh, successful. Uh, so I'd like to show just one example uh, how it uh, can, be, how the theory can be used. So this experiment, this is the, I think it's a really beautiful experiment that was done uh, in the laboratory of Stephen Block at Stanford University. Uh, these researchers used a uh, laser optical tra trap uh, set up to study um, for unfolding of individual riboswitch molecules. So uh, you you probably know the riboswitch is. Riboswitch is the is an RNA molecule that folds onto itself. Uh, uh, it forms loopy bundles, and by doing that, it can turn out genes on or shut them down. So uh, these researchers uh, grabbed this riboswitch by two ends and pulled them pulled it apart using optical uh, tweezers. And one of the uh, data that, that they have uh, measured was this distribution of rupture forces at a certain uh, value of the pulling speed. So uh, they uh, used the, the series that I just described, the red curve is, is our analytical approach, uh, to fit the experimental data. And they extracted the three parameters, just the way I, I described earlier, uh, namely the lifetime. More precisely, they were interested in the rate, which is simply one over the lifetime. Um, they uh, extracted the activation free energy barrier, which uh, they can see it was found to be something like uh, 17 kilocalories per mole. And they found the distance to the transition state in the absence of the force on the intrinsic free energy profile. And this distance was 2.1 <coughs> nanometers. So one interesting thing is that, um, so if you use our expression for, for, for the distribution of rupture forces, you would um, obtain this distance to the transition state in nanometers, right? But in, in the case of RNA, it is pretty straightforward to convert these nanometers into the number of base pairs, right? So uh, this is what they did, uh, which uh, allowed them to indicate a particular base pair in uh, a, um, it was a GZ uh, base pair in a, in a happy in P1 within this riboswitch, which um, as they, they call it, uh, represent a structural keystone, meaning once you break it apart, the break it, the entire structure falls apart. 
so uh, this is um, sort of an intermediate summary. So uh, the, this, all this quantitative description was based on the picture of diffusive crossing of a barrier in one dimension. Uh, we also assumed a quasi adiabatic approximation, and we used the relation between the survival probability and the distribution of rupture forces uh, to obtain this general expression. And then uh, it, it, this expression for P of F uh, serves a convenient starting point if one wants to develop a quantitative approach to be able to directly feed experimental data. So specifically what we did, we applied Kramer's theory to a class of microscopic models and found the uh, functional form of tau of f, the, the force dependent lifetime, and then it turned out that you can integrate that uh, expression in cl that contains tau of f and obtain the distribution of rupture force in a closed form. So. Uh, now, uh, what I'd like to, 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 to tell now is the following. It turned out that this expression, P of F, which looks very formal, uh, it turned out that it's not actually that useless as uh, it may look at, seem uh, at first, in the sense that you actually don't need to make any model assumptions to uh, you know, be able to use this expression. Uh, so what do I mean by that is the following. We can, uh, so first of all, we can, uh, again, without any model assumptions, we can uh, formally solve this equation. We can invert this equation, formally solve it for tau of f. In other words, we can pull out tau of f from this right-hand side. Uh, so again, there is no uh, any assumptions between these uh, two steps. It's just another way to rewrite the same equation. But in this form, this equation, uh, I think it it's, uh, has a truly remarkable interpretation. So let's look at the right-hand side of this equation. On the right-hand side, we have uh, this quantity P of F, which is the output of the constant speed experiment, right? In the numerator, there is an integral, which simply means we need to sum certain bins in this histogram that we measured. And in the denominator, we have F dot, which is simply the force loading rate. So the right-hand side is all about the constant speed experiment. Now, the left-hand side, however, knows nothing about constant speed experiment. It's F tau of F. It's a force-dependent lifetime, which is the output of the constant force experiment, right? So um, what this equation, this mapping relation, as we call it, uh, tells us is that the uh, outputs of the, these two kinds of pooling experiments are related in essentially a model-free way. There is no model assumptions in this uh, expression. Moreover, this equation tells us that if uh, you uh, measure the rupture force histograms at different values of the pooling speed, then by transforming them according to the right-hand side, I mean, transformation is a too fancy word for this, just essentially replotting them according to the right-hand side, one get, can get the force-dependent lifetime, which is, in principle, can be measured in the constant force experiment, but looks like there's no need to do the constant force experiment. Remember, it's a sophisticated experiment with the feedback and everything. One can get the force-dependent lifetime simply from the force histograms. So let's see how this equation uh, works. Uh, so the first example, uh, this is the experiment uh, which uses the technique of nanopore force spectroscopy. It was done by Martha and Meller uh, with nanopore unzipping uh, in, in a nanopore, uh, nanopore unzipping of, double, of um, um, individual uh, nucleic acid happenings. And what we see here is four representative uh, histograms. These are rupture force histograms obtained in the constant pulling speed experiment. Different colors emphasize that each of these histograms was obtained at different value of the pulling speed. And each of these histograms is nothing but P of F, which is uh, there in the right hand side of the mapping relation. All we need to do is to replot these histograms according to the right hand side. And this is what happens to them. So obtained at different values of the pulling speed uh, collapse on a single master curve. and what is this curve? According to the mapping relation, this curve is nothing but the force-dependent lifetime, which uh, could have been measured in the constant force experiment. Uh, so uh, conveniently, for this particular system, uh, these researchers actually did the constant force experiment. Uh, uh, directly measuring the force-dependent lifetime. So what we can do is to compare the data uh, that are obtained directly from the constant force experiment, this is the R, with the, uh, our prediction for the lifetime obtained from the histograms. And we can see that the overlap is, looks pretty good. And I would like to emphasize again that there is no single adjustable parameter used in this plot, just two sets of data obtained from two different uh, pooling experiments uh, put on the same plot. Here's another example. This is a very different experimental technique, atomic force microscopy. Schlieff and Reef uh, uh, 
used uh, this technique to study mechanical unfolding of protein titan. Uh, here again, two, uh, four representative histograms obtained and different values of the pooling speed. Uh, each of the histograms is P of F. Let's replot it according to the right-hand side of this mapping equation. And we can see that again, the histograms collapse. Uh, so uh, according to the equation, this collapse, this master curve is nothing but the force dependent lifetime. In this case, we do not have constant force data, so uh, this is uh, just a prediction. But the fact that the four histograms that are measured in such a broad range of the, of the pooling speeds, more than an order of magnitude, uh, the, the fact that they overlap so nicely, uh, I think supports the validity of, of this um, uh, collapse of this mapping relation uh, to this particular set of data. So uh, this trick, the, the trick uh, of collapsing the histograms to obtain the force dependent lifetime, it opens a new uh, way of approaching single molecule uh, data, data from single molecule pooling experiments. Namely, what one can do is to measure the rupture force histograms at different values of the pooling speed, transform them according to this mapping relation, and to obtain directly the force dependent lifetime. And then to interpret this lifetime, one can simply do the least square fit to, for example, expression for tau of f I showed you before, to obtain the three parameters that characterize the Light, the profile in the absence of the force. How am I doing on time? I'm well, sorry. We have another five minutes or so. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, so, everything I've told you up to now uh, was based on this assumption that uh, our system possesses the a slow degree of freedom. And this slow degree of freedom conveniently coincides with the end-to-end -end distance of the molecule X, right? So this allowed us to reduce this multi, inherently multidimensional problem to a one-dimensional problem, uh, which um, it turned out to be completely analytical, analytically tractable, uh, so that one could determine uh, these three parameters that characterize the uh, intrinsic kinetics uh, on this one-dimensional profile. Now, uh, limitations of this approach are uh, pretty obvious. It is not hard to imagine that x, the end-to-end -end distance, is not the slowest coordinate in the system. So let's assume that there is some other coordinate q, let's call it q, which is at least as slow as x, or maybe even slower, in which case q represents the uh, limiting step for the molecular transition. Well, if q is slow, we cannot get rid of it. We cannot adiabatically eliminate it from, from the uh, free energy uh, function, which means that we now uh, have to consider two-dimensional uh, free energy, uh, free energy landscape, which is a function of x, the pooling coordinate. This is a coordinate along which the force acts, and q, which is slow, right? So this is the problem uh, that we got interested in uh, more recently. Uh, we were interested in um, the emergent effects of multidimensionality of the free energy landscape on the uh, single molecule unfolding kinetics in the presence of the force. Uh, we decided to adopt a minimalist approach to this problem. We wanted to formulate a simplest a model that incorporates the effect of this other degree of freedom, Q, which is slow. Uh, examples of Q, well, one classical example in the protein folding science, Q uh, is used to describe the fraction of native amino acid contacts. A Q can be thought of, uh, for example, the twisting angle of DNA. It can be thought of a concentration of ATP uh, in the molecular motor stepping. Uh, it can be thought of the distribution of the hydral angles in uh, nucleic acid, happy in folding, folding, and so on. So here's the model that we uh, have uh, adopted. As you can see, now the free energy is a function of two coordinates, x, the pulling coordinate, and q, another slow coordinate. And this profile looks uh, pretty typical for, for this kind of problems. We have a folded uh, basin, right, the folded state, and we have a single pathway that leads the um, reactive flux over the settle point to the unfolded state. Here is the uh, mathematical form in which this model can be written. Uh, it's a pretty simple expression. Importantly, the free energy G is now a function of two coordinates, X and Q. The last term reflects the effect of the constant mechanical force. Uh, so uh, we run Brownian dynamics on this model, on this two-dimensional free energy profile. And what we found is that uh, this model reveals a rich spectrum of 
possible scenarios for the force-dependent lifetime, possible scenarios with which the molecule can respond to force. So one of the scenarios is, looks pretty typical. The lifetime goes down as the force is increased. But some others look really strange. And in particular, uh, let's look at this one, which we call a rollover. Uh, we can see that at, in the high force regime, the lifetime goes down as expected, but in the low force regime, the lifetime actually increases, which may seem counterintuitive because it means that you, uh, increase, you increase in the force, which makes the molecule live even longer in the folded state. Uh, so uh, first of all, I'd like to mention that uh, this rollover scenario, the non-monotonic uh, behavior in the lifetime, when the lifetime goes up and then goes down, has been observed in many different systems, both in vivo and in MD simulations. Uh, one example includes um, cage bonds that are formed between leukocytes and the molecules that line the vascular, vascular surfaces. Uh, the first direct observation of um, the catch bond invo involving cell adhesion molecules was done uh, back in 2003. Uh, what we can see here is the experimental data for the lifetime, the vertical axis, uh, um, as a function of force, as a horizontal axis. And we can see that the lifetime clearly shows increase, and then this increase is followed by de a decrease. Uh, the uh, non monotonic lifetimes, such as the rollover, have been observed in mo molecular dynamic simulations of mechanical unfolding of proteins. Uh, this uh, picture shows uh, perhaps the first MD study that was done by Manuel Pachi and, and uh, co authors back in 2006, where you can see that for two proteins, protein L and for Titan, uh, the lifetime goes up in the f low force regime and then uh, it goes down. We also showed uh, later that the same behavior can be observed uh, in the case of, of, of ubiquitin. Now, uh, what I would like to turn your attention to is how to interpret this non-monotonic behavior, the increase in lifetime, which is followed by decrease. Uh, in the literature, this kind of complex response by a molecule to force, such as the non-monotonic lifetimes, have always been explained in terms of the two competing pathways on the free energy landscape. So uh, this is a pretty obvious explanation. You have a free energy landscape which have two competing pathways. One pathway is favored in the low force regime. The second pathway is favored in the high force regime. And there is a discrete switch between these two pathways at some intermediate force. And this results in this non-monotonic uh, profile for the lifetime. Now, what is interesting, our model has only one pathway. It has only one barrier. It's still, this model shows that uh, this non-monotonic lifetime uh, scenario can be realized on such a simple uh, model. So if not multiple pathways or multiple barriers, then what is it that is responsible for this non-monotonicity, for this complex behavior of response of the molecule to force? Well, the mechanism is, is uh, remarkably simple. And again, it's related to this, the, the, something that I talked about when I talked about one-dimensional theory. Uh, it's simply based on the fact that the transition state moves with respect to the folded state uh, as a function of the force. So it is not uh, difficult to imagine a situation where in the absence of the force, the dissociation pathway is oriented unfavorably with respect to the force. So when you apply the stretching force, you tilt the, the landscape in the wrong direction. But then, because as the force is increased, the transition state moves with respect to the folded state which means that the pathway that gets distorted and it gets oriented more and more favorably with respect to the stretching force. So eventually the force is, uh, actually becomes helpful in, uh, in um, it helps the molecule to attain the transition state. So this results is this non-monotonic profile for the lifetime. Uh, as we can see in this example, the, the pathway is first oriented uh, unfavorably with respect to the pulling direction x. And then, uh, because of the force, the pathway gets reoriented so that the force becomes efficient. Uh, this, the same phenomena can be, uh, the same idea can be restated in terms of the, uh, in sort of using molecular picture. For example, ligand and receptors that behave effectively as hooks. So uh, clearly, if you pull on two hooks with, with some not too high force, you only make it worse, right? You only make this, uh, this pair to live longer in the uh, bound state. However, as the force is increased, uh, the structure of the hooks will get more and more distorted, and eventually uh, the force will become helpful in dissoci dissociating these hooks uh, from one another. And this is my last uh, uh, slide. Uh, I would like to um, also mention that we uh, wanted to approach this uh, multidimensional problem uh, analytically. Uh, so we are talking now about diffusive crossing of a barrier uh, in uh, two dimensions. Uh, the um, uh, Kramer theory was generalized by Langer in, back in uh, 69. 
uh, uh, to the case of uh, more than one dimension. Uh, and uh, uh, I would like to mention this beautiful paper by uh, Northrop and Annie McCommon. Uh, they showed in 83 that um, on the multidimensional landscape, the lifetime, uh, first of all, is determined both of the, by the topological features and the friction features of the landscape, but they also showed that under some, some circumstances, uh, the reactive flux can actually bypass the settle point and reach the unfolded state, the phenomenon that is now known as the settle point, point avoidance. So uh, here's our um, closed form solution that shows how exactly the uh, lifetime is determined by the topological and diffusive frictional properties of the landscape. And uh, uh, we were very excited to find that this expression is able to reproduce all the scenarios for the lifetime of the two-dimensional landscape that we obtained from Brownian dynamic simulations. Now I'd like to conclude, uh, basically, uh, I would like to emphasize three key messages for, uh, that um, I would like to convey uh, in this talk. Uh, first of all, uh, the problem of force-induced molecular transition can be uh, treated uh, as the one dimension, as diffusive crossing of a barrier in one dimension, and one can obtain analytical solutions for two key experimental observables, uh, which would uh, allow one to extract the features of the intrinsic uh, free energy landscape, such as lifetime, the width of the barrier, and the barrier height. The second message is this mapping relation that allows one to take the rupture force histograms and by a very simple transformation, collapse them on a single master curve, which is the force dependent lifetime, in principle uh, measurable in the constant force experiment. And the third message is that um, a complex response of biomolecule to force, for example, in the form of a non-monotonic dependence of the lifetime on the force can be explained by a remarkably simple but largely overlooked mechanism. And the mechanism <coughs> is based on the natural movement of the transition state with respect to the bound state. And uh, finally, and most importantly, I would like to thank all the people uh, for the pleasure of working with them over the years on, on this uh, different aspects of the theory. Uh, these are people in Tel Aviv University, Sasha Filipov, Yossi Klafter, and Misha Urbach, uh, people at the NIH, Attila Zavon, Gerhard Hammer. Uh, the multidimensional approach to uh, single molecule rupture was done by Yuhichi Suzuki, who is a postdoc in my group sitting here. And I would like to acknowledge our sponsors, National Science Foundation and Hellman Family Foundation. And thank you all very much for your uh, attention. Why don't we see if there are any questions here in San Diego and then see if there are questions in Heidelberg. Any questions here? Uh, what was K in the, your uh, different lifetime expressions? You had a... K in yeah. the multidimensional lifetime. Yeah, the K was the curvature, the curvature of the landscape in the well, in the well region and in the, in the barrier region. Okay, so this is where you're making assumptions of the uh, what, linear versus cusp or the... Uh, well, you can use any model you want to calculate the curvature. For example, linear cubic. Yeah. Okay. And then a lot of this was in the in this regime where all the other degrees of freedom were sort of in a thermal equilibrium with your uh, coordinate. Um, what I mean, what checks are there experimentally for knowing whenever you're starting to do work on the system and this breaks down? Uh, you mean what is experimental test? How to see whether the one-dimensional description is? Uh, yeah. Like if, if you're just pulling too fast, I mean, um, how can you tell whenever that? the model never, uh, no longer holds? Uh, well, uh, so the question was how one can tell whether the assumption of uh, this slow coordinate is true, right? X is slow coordinate. Uh, well, you know, I mean, the simple answer is if you, have, if you see some uh, complex uh, dependence of the lifetime as a function of force, this may be an indication, as I, as I showed, that there is another slow degree of freedom uh, in the system. But generally, one should not pull too fast. I mean, this was one of the key assumptions, quasi-adiabatic approximation. We really, we, we, what we need is a separation of time scales. We need the system to be able to equilibrate very rapidly in the well before uh, it escapes over the barrier. So to ensure the separation of time scales, we cannot lower the barrier too fast. And this is what this quasi-adiabatic approximation means, which is, in fact, I don't think it's that restrictive as, as my sound. I think most of the experiments currently are perfectly fine within this range of, of pulling speeds that are not too fast. So any questions in Heidelberg? No questions. It's all very clear. 
Thank you. Any other? No, I think I think we should move on to the next one. Thank you very much.